when I read scripture, I believe that Jesus is coming back from victorious church, an overcoming church, the bride of Christ, ready for his return. Not some washed out, pathetic church that's just clinging on. And once you get in your mind that actually Jesus is about to return and he's coming back for church that's clinging on by its fingernails, you lose hope, you lose faith, you just cling on. And if that cons when that concept grips whole churches, you can work out what happens yourself. This is GBC Web TV on the internet at gbcweb.tv. Welcome to Greenford Baptist Church in West London. Here you can watch inspired biblical teaching and find out how to apply God's word to your everyday lives. Father God, thank you for your presence with us so far this morning. As we've worshipped, as we've prayed. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you've been working among us. And Father, now as we come to look at your word, we ask that you will give us understanding, that your spirit will continue to be as active in our lives, in our meeting together, as we look at your word, as you have been in our worship and prayer. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If uh, I went round and did a survey this morning, and uh, I'm not going to, but if I did, and you're typical people, and I think you're fairly typical people, fairly typical Christians, and I said to you, do you think that the book of Revelation is part of God's word? I think without exception, I'd get the answer, yes. A few nods? Yeah? Okay. If I then said to you, when did you last read it or study it? I suspect that the answers would be not recently. The fact is that for a lot of Christians in the UK, whilst in theory the book of Revelation is, in part, is part of God's word, in practice it's not. And it's not because they never read it, they don't even look at it. So before we, or as we start this morning, uh, let me ask, what is it about this book that we're going to be looking at uh, all the way through, starting today, uh, for as long as it takes during this year when I'm teaching on Sunday mornings? What is it about this book that means that we, Christians in the UK, it's probably true in other places as well, don't read it very often, don't look at it, and there's not a lot of teaching from it either? So what is it about this book? It concerns the future. Concerns the future? Too many images that require in-depth uh, interpretation. Okay. Images that are hard to understand, yes. It's very overwhelming. It's scary. Because <laughs> <coughs> some people don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Anything else? The, the imagery there is so far removed from our lives. It's the future for all mankind. Mm -hmm. Couple more. Um, it, it talks about the truth and uh, the, the real truth of what is actually coming. And most people really are not courageous enough to actually face to that, but come face. Okay. Two more. Powerful and hard to understand. I'm always afraid when I open it, so I don't read it much. Okay. Thank you. Well, I believe, and it won't surprise you, that I believe that this book of Revelation is as much as part of God's Word as anything else in the Bible. The Gospels, uh, Paul's letters, these things that we read so often, this is as much as God's Word. It's a part of what God has provided for us. And if we don't read it, and we don't understand it, I believe that we miss out. You know, in our uh, everyday food diet, those of you that eat a balanced diet, there are some things that you really love eating. You know, chocolate. There are other things that are just a bit harder. Uh, but you need the mixture of those. And I recognise that the book of Revelation is 
Not an easy book to read. It's not an easy book to understand. But it is a book that's important that we both read and understand, which is why we're going to be looking at it over the next few months. Now let me explain about this morning. Normally when I come to teach, I take a, a, a slab of scripture and we work through it together. Um, but what I want to do this morning is to give some background to understanding the book of Revelation. We're going to look at a few verses briefly this morning at the end, but most of what I want to do is to, is to put a framework down to help us understand what to do with this book. And then next week we're going to start what is one of my favourite passages in the whole of the Bible, which is the next section we're going to look at from Revelation next week, which is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, fantastic passage. So we're going to look at that next week and get really... I'm excited about next week already, but we're going to need to do some work together today to help us handle this book and understand this book. So it's part of God's Word. We need to be uh, looking at it. And as I say, this morning, uh, it's mainly background that's going to give us some understanding. So let's think about this book. This was not written as a theological treatise. This was not written as a book that was difficult to read. In fact, it wasn't written as a book at all. This is a pastoral letter. This is a letter written by John to the churches in Asia. It was probably written around 90 years after Jesus was born, give or take a few years. The society in, uh, in Asia, the area that this book describes as Asia, we would now call Turkey. And uh, it's the uh, coastal region on the west coast of Turkey. That's where these churches that are named in this book were, or in this letter, were situated. Written around 90 AD, society was in a stage of ongoing crisis. There have been a whole series of, of major wars. We're not talking about little skirmishes, but major wars. And that really had created a, a ferment of, of anxiety within the empire, the Roman Empire. And just uh, ten or so years before this was written, there was a huge event. You know about it. You won't connect it with this book, but you know about it. There was a volcano. In fact, I was only a few months ago standing on the top of said volcano, Vesuvius. And it blew its lid. And it buried the whole of Pompeii. Some of you will, you know, you'll be familiar with that. Some of you will have been there as I have to the volcano, been around uh, Pompeii. Can you imagine the impact that had in the surrounding area? Because there was no warning. Nobody knew this was going to happen. One day, I mean, that's the, the incredible thing about Pompeii, you walk around and it was just frozen in time, in lava and ash, just in a moment, wiped out. And that had a huge impact across society. So in society there is this uncertainty, there is crisis, just this sense of crisis that is around. Now, if you were a Christian in those days, in this region, uh, it wasn't actually illegal to be a Christian. It wasn't a crime. You couldn't be prosecuted simply for being a Christian. But, and it is a big but, Christians were often subject to discrimination and to harassment. They were considered to be a dangerous sect. And if a Christian ended up coming to court, maybe uh, they were being prosecuted for something else, or, or maybe somebody had declared, you know, they, one of Richard's neighbours took a dislike to Richard. So they went along to the court and said, you know that fellow Richard that lives down the road? He is a, he is a Christian. And because he's a Christian, he actually is opposed to your government. And so Richard would find himself dragged off to court, and he would be asked to do three things. 
Firstly, to confess that Caesar is Lord. Because it was believed by the Roman state and the Roman authorities that the Caesar, the emperor, was actually divine. That he was God. And the phrase, Jesus is Lord, which was used by the Christians, is deliberately chosen to emphasise the fact that it wasn't Caesar, it is Jesus who is Lord. So he would be said, the first thing, Richard, you'd be asked to do was to make that confession, Caesar is Lord. And once you'd done that, you'd be asked to make an offering in the court. There'd be a, 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 a picture, uh, obviously not a photograph, but a painting or an image of Caesar. And you would ask Richard to come and, and to stand before that and to make an offering to Caesar. The third thing you'd be asked to do is then to curse Christ. To any Christians ended up in court, that's what happened. If you declined to do any of those three things, you would be tortured to try and persuade you to change your mind. And if that didn't work, you would be executed often in a pretty horrendous way. They had some novel ways of getting rid of Christians. Uh, one local authority said it was a great idea to dip them in tar and set fire to them and use them as torches. So there were all sorts of novel ways they had of uh, disposing of, of Christians. These people who were seen to be uh, seditious, seen to be part of a dangerous sect. Now, I could have picked on any of you this morning. I happened to have picked on Richard because he's sitting in the, you know, in the blessed seat at the front here. But I want you to think for a moment. Just think about yourself. And think about this same was the case for you. And you are being you. Some people you know, some of your Christian brothers and sisters have already been taken off to court. And they've been given these options. Now I'm not going to ask you what you would do at this point in time. I'm going to ask you that in a few moments time. But I want you to think about what options Christians might take in that situation. So I'm not asking what you would do, so this isn't personal. But uh, in that situation, what options might Christians take? When they came and they found themselves in that situation of being in court and being asked to do those three things with the consequences. If they did them, they would walk away. If they didn't do them, it was torture to try and persuade them to change their minds. And if that didn't work, it was a pretty horrendous death. What options do you think Christians might have chosen in that context? I think they might have chosen to do what they were asked, but almost at the same time be praying to God, saying, Lord, you know this is, I'm doing this outwardly to kind of get by, but inwardly I do trust you. There'd be that kind of dual thing going on. Absolutely right. That was one of the options that some Christians took. They basically lied. They stood in court, they said Caesar is Lord, they made the offering, they cursed Christ, and... You know, to, to use it, they had, they had their fingers crossed behind their backs, if you understand the image. If you're English, you'll know that, that image. Uh, it, it's it's that, that sense of doing it because they saw it as being the lesser of two evils. So that was one whole thing, and that's addressed in the book of Revelation. We'll come to later on. That was one option. What were the other options? they done it. They actually, um, they, they didn't confess, they, they, they uh, went through and, uh, went th and became martyrs. Yeah, and we know that many did that as well. There are books of martyrs, there are actually accounts in some of the Roman documents from the time about some of these people, other historical documents about Christians that refused to do that and uh, there are some quite gory details in some of those about how these people were tortured, what was done to them and, and how they, they died and how um, they honoured God in their death. Two options. What's the third option? There's a third option. Just, you know, so we don't miss it out. Um, run away, leave the country, and go to somewhere else where you think it's more safe. That is, yeah, that's a fourth option. That wasn't the one I was thinking of. <laughs> but, but once you're actually in court, that's not an option. Once you're in court, you might want to do that beforehand, but once you're in court, that's not an option. 
Sorry about that. You know, they manacles and, and things like that. Well, if you were a very good orator and very confident, you might try to convert the people in the court. You might try and convert the people in the court. Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't what the one that was in my mind. But uh, you don't know how true how um, true to Caesar the official was, and you may have pre-bribed them and got around it that way. There could be a way of getting around the court system. Yeah, yeah. That didn't work actually. But yeah, that's a possibility. But it didn't actually work. There is there is something quite obvious that we still haven't got yet. He lost your faith because you didn't feel like God was protecting you and you went with it. Absolutely. And there were people that did that. They abandoned their Christian faith and said, um, oh, uh, uh, yes, I used to believe that, but I now recant. I no longer uh, believe that and turn away from their Christian faith. And there were Christians that did that as well. And we will find more of that in the book of Revelation as we go through. Now I want you to think for a moment, I don't want any answers, I don't want any hands up, but I want you to think for a moment, just put yourself in that social context. Don't try and imagine yourself back in Roman times, that's just too big a stretch. But just imagine that right now in the UK, you are in that same situation. It's not illegal for you to be coming to church here on a Sunday morning. It's not illegal for you to be reading your Bible, but you are considered to be a part of a dangerous sect. And anybody who you might offend, or anybody who you might, you know, maybe your business is going well and their business isn't going so well, they could denounce you to the local court as being seditious and you'd be brought and you'd be asked these questions and faced with those options. Just imagine how that felt. Imagine how it would feel for you if that was your situation. Just think about it for a moment. Think about how it might affect some of the ways you look at life. The ways that you Look at your family. And this is the situation that the churches were facing in nature. Those feelings, and I'm not going to ask you because it, it's, it's not appropriate to do that, but those feelings that are rising up inside you, as you think about that, for some there are feelings of, there would be feelings of terror, of fear, uh, how will I survive this? Is God actually in control anymore? If this is happening, you know, my brothers and sisters who were in my meeting together group were tortured and killed last month. Is God actually in control? What is going on in society? What is happening? Does God, you know, all of that, imagine, coming up to the surface, yeah? And that is why John wrote this letter, and that is what the book of Revelation is about. It is addressing those issues for people in those situations. Now we need to uh, begin to think about the nature of this letter. It was written by John to people he knew, but it wasn't written to be a book that was put on the shelf. What it was written for was this. In ordinary worship, whenever they worshipped Saturday or Sunday, for someone to stand and to read the letter in one go from start to finish to the congregation. They didn't study it a few verses at a time. They looked at the whole thing, listened to it together. Now, I, I'm not sure this illustration is going to work. How many of you have listened to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Okay, that's not going to work hugely. How many of you have listened to a science fiction radio play? Is that, is that a few more of you? Yeah, okay. I say radio because uh, the way that this worked is that as people listened to it, there were a whole series of images. And some of these images are absolutely impossible. As we see as we go through, if you try and actually picture the image, it's impossible. It's a bit like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where you've got these absolutely impossible things being described that are just impossible. 
But the whole point is, what does it stand for? How does that communicate? What effect does that have? And so this was written to be listened to. And we're not going to do it at the start, but we may at the end. It's my intention. After we've gone through a fair chunk of Revelation and we've worked out how to understand this, that we will do this. Maybe not on a Sunday morning, maybe on another occasion. We will come together in the context of worship. We will listen to the whole of the book of Revelation being read and experience it like those first Christians at that time experienced the book. Now, you need to understand that the hearers would have easily understood the contents. This wasn't written in some secret code so people couldn't understand. All the terminology, all the images to the people that received this letter as they listened to it being read would have all made sense. They knew what ten horns meant. They knew what, what this symbol meant, what that symbol meant. They just knew it straight away. They didn't need someone to come along and explain it, as we're going to do in the coming months. And they were familiar with this style of writing. Revelation is, is written in a style that is called apocalyptic. It's a particular style of writing. And this is not a unique book. It's unique in that this is God's word and in scripture, but in the same way that the Gospels are not unique, there were hundreds of other books written about other people other than Jesus, written in the same style, with the same format, and uh, you know, the, the same fact that, that things didn't happen, they were grouped, subjects were grouped around, so events were grouped around subject, not time. They're written in a whole different way to the way that we write history. We need to understand that when we read the Gospels. This was not a unique piece of writing. There are many, many other apocalyptic writings, many other Christian ones and Jewish ones that we still have today. This is the only one that was actually inspired by God in the way we believe our Bible to be. But they were familiar with it. They didn't listen to it and think, what on earth is that? The moment he was reading, they recognised it. They knew what to do with it. They knew how to understand it. They knew what the message would be. Because all apocalyptic writing has the same message. And it's basically this. That despite appearances, despite what you see, what is going on, God is in control. He's got a plan. And he's going to see it through. He's going to see it completed. That's the fundamental message of the book of Revelation, as it was with all apocalyptic writing. So for them, it wasn't a strange thing. It was God speaking into their lives and situations. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation today, it's a mystery to us. A lot of us, as we look and we read it, we think, what on earth is this about? And how do we understand it? And if you go and you get books of interpreting Revelation, you'll find that they disagree massively on what different bits mean. But there are basically four approaches, or there are four basic approaches to understanding the book of Revelation. And I'm going to describe all four of them because you will come across all four of them. And then I'm going to uh, explain the method that I'm going to use when we uh, work through the book of Revelation. So this is a bit theoretical. So if you want to doze off for the next few minutes, that's fine. It's not essential. I'll tell you when the important bit comes, when, when I explain what I'm going to do. But I think it's important because it's been so misinterpreted that it's important that I try and explain a bit of that. So um, apologies if this is a bit technical, but I think it's important to do that. So four basic approaches. Approach number one is this. It looks at the book of Revelation and says it is only about events that were facing those first Christians. So everything in the whole of this letter has already happened. 
It was addressed to Christians at that time who needed to know what was going on, what was happening in their situation, and what was going to happen in the next few years. It wasn't designed to predict the, the long-term future. It wasn't about the end of time. It's all limited back to that time. So we look at it as a document about God speaking to those Christians at that time. And we see how God cared for them. We see what God did there. But it's got no relevance for the rest of history. And that's a fairly common, not the most common, but it's a fairly common way of approaching the book. The big problem with that way, of course, is that if that was the case, then the author John got it wrong. Because the book finishes, and you, you know, if you want to know how the book finishes, read the last couple of chapters this week. Got a great ending. I don't know if you do that when you read books. Do you do that sometimes? Look at the ending and see how it's going to all work out. Got a fantastic ending. Read the last couple of chapters. Won't all make sense to you, but, but just read it. It's all about God's victory at the end of time. It's all about time as we know it being wound up and God's kingdom coming in fullness, totally, absolutely, on the earth and throughout the universe. That's where we're going. Great ending. But as far as I know, that hasn't happened yet which is why that method of interpreting Revelation on itself is not adequate. Because <laughs> it doesn't explain that. Okay, second approach. And uh, this one is more of a warning. Yeah, there are many books been written on Revelation over the last uh, 2,000 years. And the way a lot of them work is this. Um, some highly inspired uh, writer uh, feels that as they look at the world now, they know exactly where they are in history. And they can pinpoint where in the book of Revelation they are right now. And on the basis of that certainty, they can tell you what's going to happen next week, I exaggerate slightly, but next year and in the coming couple of years. So they place themselves at a particular point in the book and say, this is where we are now, this is what has happened, and this is how we understand these signs, and then this is what's going to happen next. Now, I get emails like this probably three or four a year. They're usually incredibly long. I had one recently that was over 20 pages that was this approach to Revelation, basically saying, God has said, this is where we are, so this is what's happened, and so this is what's going to happen now, and this is what you need to do. And God's saying this, and if you don't receive my word, you are going to be cursed and cut, and all of this sort of stuff, you know. So people kindly send me those emails from time to time. Very grateful to receive them, and the fact they've got a delete button on my computer. <laughs> and it's when you look at those from another time period, you realise, it's obvious, you look at one of these that was written in you know, the 1800s or the 1400s or 700 or 200, and you realise that it's wrong. And that's a warning about doing that today. <laughs> you with me? It's a warning about doing that today. So that's another method that you'll find. This is another very common method. Uh, it looks at Revelation and say, well, actually, it's got nothing to do with any particular period of history. What it does is it, it teaches us timeless truths about how God acts in history. So we can't look at it for predictions about the future or understanding about now or particular understanding about the past. There are these, if you like, these timeless principles that, that go through history and that we can look at those and draw on those. The problem with that is that that would not have been a lot of use to the people in AD 90 when they had the letter read to them in their Sunday worship. They didn't need to know timeless truths about how God intervenes in history. What they needed to know is what is God saying to them this morning when this week they could lose their life. When they've got this state this huge government that is so opposed to Christians, who m not many years later, it became a crime to be a Christian. 
Massive persecution. Hadn't happened when the book was written, but it is talked about in the book. They didn't need timeless principles. They needed God's word for now. You don't want me to stand in front of you on a Sunday and give you timeless principles. What you want to know is, what's God saying to us this week, Pastor? Is that right? So that's the problem with that. It's not adequate by itself. And here's the fourth one. And this is, I haven't given you the fancy names for the others. They've all got uh, fancy names, but I'm not going to bother with those. But this one, I'm going to use the fancy name because this one is one that uh, is very, very common. It's very prevalent indeed. It's called dispensationalism. And uh, there's a particular uh, form of it called premillennial dispensationalism, uh, which I'll make a comment about in a little while. How many people are familiar with that term? A fair few, a fair few, you will have come across it. Now let me explain how dispensationalism works. Firstly, I want to say that it's been, it, it is hugely influential currently. I don't mean just historically, but now. Uh, the Schofield Reference Bible uh, was written um, based on dispensationalism, dispensational thinking, and has popularised it very much so. Also, the Dallas Theological Seminary in the States came out of this uh, approach to Scripture and, uh, and they teach it um, solidly. And it's become a very, very powerful uh, uh, thing in people's understanding of, of the whole of history and what is to come. And it's been reflected also in a lot of popular Christian writings. It's around in some of the, the series of books that you'll find. There's books like The Late Great Planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, uh, that sort of uh, uh, approach. Um, it's also there in the, in the Left Behind series. You've come across those books. Some of you have, have read those. It's, it's, it's in there as well. Uh, and uh, the way that it works is this. It looks at, as you, most of you may be aware, chapters... Uh, two and three of Revelation have seven letters written to seven different churches. And we're going to look at those in, in the coming weeks. Dispensationalism says this, those aren't actually real letters written to real churches. What they are is a description of seven consecutive periods of time. And so we start off with the first period of time, the Ephesian age. And then we have the Smyrna age, then the Pergamon age, and so on and so on. So seven different dispensations or periods of time of church history. And that right now, dispensation teaches, we are in the seventh of those, which is known as the Laodicean age. That's the period of time that we are now in, according to dispensationalism. So we've left all the others, and this is the period that we're now in. And we are on the eve, we're on the verge of seeing the rapture, or what some call the great snatch. When Jesus comes out of heaven, grabs all of the, the Christians in the state they're in, which I'll tell you about in a moment, rushes them back up to heaven, and then... Chapter 4, verse 1, is where that happens. Chapter 4, verse 2, then, is what happens from that point on for the next, depending on uh, your interpretation, typically for the next thousand years. You with me? So this is the church that Jesus is coming back for, according to dispensational thinking. This is the description of that church. And I'm reading from Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know your deeds. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of these. So because you are not lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked and so on. That's the church of the Laodicean age, and according to dispensationalism, that is the church that Jesus is coming back for. You don't sound too keen. Now, there are a lot of problems with dispensational uh, teaching, particularly premillennial dispensationalism. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to unpack it all, but there are loads of problems. Firstly, uh, again, um, this would not have been an awful lot of help, this book, to Christians that John was writing to. Because, <laughs> you know, we're now 2000, well, 1900 years on, and we haven't got to chapter 4, verse 1 yet. Not a lot of use to the first century Christians. But in passing, I want to say that I believe that particularly premillennial dispensationalism, but dispensationalism itself, is actually deeply damaging. Hear me, it's deeply damaging. It strangles life out of believers and strangles life out of churches. If you believe that this is the sort of church that Jesus is coming back for, God help you. And I mean that with the full force of that. God help you because you need help. When I read scripture, I believe that Jesus is coming back from victorious church, an overcoming church, the bride of Christ ready for his return. Not some washed out, pathetic church that's just clinging on. And once you get in your mind that actually Jesus is about to return and he's coming back for church that's clinging on by its fingernails, you lose hope, you lose faith, you just cling on. And if that cons when that concept grips whole churches, you can work out what happens yourself. So I believe that is uh, deeply flawed, it's damaging, and you shouldn't have anything to do with it. So if you're waiting for the rapture, and the, uh, then the, uh, the thousand years, I think you've misunderstood. And hopefully in the coming weeks and months, we'll get it right together. So how do I understand and how am I going to interpret the book of Revelation as we work through? Well, it seems to me and it seems to lots of other people, I'm not unique in this, I'm not about to launch some complete unique way of understanding the book of Revelation that's never been done by anybody else in history. You might be relieved to know that because if I was doing that, it's a good time to go and find another church. <laughs> I, I believe that each of these different approaches here has got some benefit for us. Clearly, it is a fact that this had relevance for people in John's day, the letter would have been completely pointless and meaningless if when it was read to those Christians there in the first century, God didn't speak into their situation out of that book. Of course it was relevant to them, of course it was about them. Absolutely, yes. But that's not the end of the story. I believe it is true that some of this stuff in the book of Revelation has already happened. It has already been fulfilled. And we're going to look at some of that as we go through. I do think that this book helps us to understand the way that God works in history. We're going to just touch on that at the end of this morning. Because God knows what he's doing in history. <laughs> and it helps us to understand that as well. And it is true that the main thrust of this letter is how history will eventually work out because Jesus is coming again and it's going to be victorious and he's going to overcome all of the darkness, all of the sin, all of Satan's power in this world. It's going to be wiped out and removed. Amen. Amen. That's the end of the story. But none of those things in itself is enough. We need to be looking at those things together and asking the question about what God is saying to us now in our situation. You'll see how that works as we work through uh, week by week. The final thing that I want to say before we look at the first passage this morning is a comment about prophecy itself. We need to remind ourselves, this is not new, I've said this on many, many occasions, that prophecy is not primarily prediction. We have a prophetic group in the church here called Envisioned. And they would have been meeting tonight, but because of the uh, severe weather, they've chosen not to meet this evening. But when they meet together and pray together, they're not meeting to try and predict the future. They're not meeting to try and hear what God is saying about what's going to happen next week, next month, or next year. 
what they're meeting for is to hear God speak into their situation now and prepare them for what is coming and to help us as a church prepare for what is coming. It's about getting hold of God's word and seeing it released into people's lives. It's not about saying next Tuesday afternoon at half past three, this is going to happen. It's not about prediction, it's about God's word being released into people's lives. What John's readers needed to know was not what was going to happen next Tuesday afternoon at half past three, but what they needed to know, and this is true for every one of you, I hope, in this situation we face, what is God saying to us? As we face the possibility for them of death, of torture and of death, we're in a context where society seems to be out of control, where nature itself seems to be out of control. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> where nature itself seems to be out of control. Into this context, what is God saying? And what does it mean about how we should live? That's what this book is about. That's what prophecy is about. And to quote uh, a New Testament commentator, and this really is their name. I'm not making this up. Their name is Boring. <laughs> and you'll hear from Boring quite a lot because uh, the commentary that uh, uh, he has written is uh, very, very good and helpful, and I'm going to refer to it on a number of occasions as we go through. But um, uh, that really is the name. And the letter, to quote him, the letter makes clear that the events they're facing were not meaningless tragedy, but part of God's plan for the consummation of history. You know, that changes how you feel about things. If something happens in your life and your circumstances, that when you look at it, is an incredible tragedy. And when you look at it, it has no meaning or no redeeming factors, it feels hopeless. But when you can look at it and can see with the help of God's word that actually this is a tragedy, but it does have meaning and significance, and God is still in control, <laughs> it gives you hope. It doesn't take away the pain, but it gives you hope. And that's what this book is about. This letter, that's what it meant to the people that received it, that's what it means for us. So very briefly this morning, and it is briefly, we're going to look at uh, just the first eight verses, and then next week we're going to start in earnest with verse 9. Let's take a breather for a moment because there's been actually that's been quite intense. Why don't you turn to the person next to you? Apart from Timmy, you'll have to find somebody else. <laughs> turn to the person next to you and just say one or two things that has struck you this morning as you've listened so far. One or two things you found helpful this morning or found challenging this morning. Just share that with the person sitting next to you. You've got 90 seconds. Thank you. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who wants to be blessed this morning? Okay, this is one of the ways you can be blessed. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Blessed are those that read it, and the context there was it being read out loud in worship. Blessed are those who hear, and blessed are those who take it to heart because the time is near. You're going to get really blessed as we go through the book of Revelation. 
you're going to get really blessed. There are parts of it that are gory, parts of it that are a bit depressing by themselves, but as we go through, you're going to be blessed. Because it's God's word, but also because God promises a special blessing to those who read this book. As far as I recall, there isn't any other book of the Bible that actually tells you you're going to be particularly blessed if you read it. Well, this book says that, and God says that to you this morning. And these things, right at the beginning, it says, are going to soon take place. The time is near. It's that sort of comment that has led people to that very first interpretation, to say, well, all of this must clearly have happened in the lifetime of those who received this letter. But they misunderstand part of the nature, and we see this elsewhere in the New Testament. Every generation, including ours, includes all of you, need to live as though Jesus is coming back in our generation. I've said to you on many occasions, I've asked you the question, I'm not going to do it this morning, but just to remind you, I've asked you the question, if you knew that Jesus was coming back next Wednesday evening, if you knew that Jesus was coming back next Wednesday evening, how would it change the way you live between now and then? I'm not going to ask you that this morning, but I'll tell you the answer. The answer is it shouldn't make the slightest difference. Because we need to be living like that all the time. Putting our total faith and trust in God and doing all that he asks of us. Not putting things off. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Oh, this is only the introduction. This is the, uh, the standard opening of a letter of those days. Who it's to, grace and peace, greetings. The, uh, the choice of the seven churches there is, uh, it's symbolic. We're going to look at the number seven later. But we know without doubt that there were other churches in between these churches in exactly the same region. So uh, the choice of seven is a symbolic thing, as all the numbers in the book are, and we'll look at that on a subsequent occasion. Notice these titles of Jesus. The faithful witness. Now that word witness, the Greek word for witness, is the word that we get the English word martyr from. So the word there for witness in Greek, it's martyrs. It's the word that we get the word martyr from. Someone who is killed for their faith and belief. Jesus is the faithful witness. The faithful martyr. Already sound rather relevant to their situation? <laughs> the firstborn from the dead. So if someone dies... <laughs> The firstborn has gone ahead from the dead already. And he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Do you see how those three titles immediately speak into their situation? Faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's over and above Caesar. In our context... Here, now, in West London, in 2010, or 2010, I still can't make my mind up which year I'm in. What do those titles mean for us? Those three titles, faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
What do they mean for us? Jesus overcame death. He's, he's done it all. So what uh, it's talked about in the New Testament and the promises of the Old Testament have already come to fruition. We're living in that time. Thank you. Anybody else? That Jesus is all in all from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, ruler of the earth, ruler of all the kings, Jesus is in control. He's Lord of all. Excellent. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priests. We've been looking at that a lot from our uh, motto in uh, 1 Peter. Kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And when you include that, if you're in the, in the saying of the time, if something's the Alpha and the Omega, it's the beginning, the end, and everything in between. So God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Do you know, history isn't going in circles. History is not out of control. History is in God's hands. History, after all, excuse the play on the English word, is his story. <laughs> it's God's story. He started at Alpha. He's going to end at Omega. I'm not quite sure where in the alphabet he is at this particular point in time. He's a not, lot nearer Omega than Alpha, that's for sure. But wherever he is, he's systematically working through, going to see it come about, bring it all into place. It's true in the big spread of history. It's true also in your lives. It's true also in your lives. He has a plan and purpose for you. And what he started, he's going to finish. He's going to see it through. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's going to see it through. And a time is going to come, looking right at the end of the book already, when Jesus will return. And when he comes, every eye will see. And Paul adds, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not going to be a voluntary decision. <laughs> there are some of us who voluntarily bow the knee and say, Jesus is Lord. There will come a day when everyone will have to do that, voluntary or otherwise, because his lordship will be so established, every other power will be broken and destroyed. That day is coming. There we finish for this morning. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. Uh, my time uh, has gone this morning. I'd like to encourage you to read... Uh, from verse 9 down to um, the rest of the chapter of, verse, of chapter 1, before you come next time, read it. Allow those images to just wash over you. Don't worry if you don't understand all the imagery, because next Sunday we're going to look at those together, and uh, it is really exciting. Really exciting. So, key things to take away from this morning. Reading Revelation brings blessing. Amen? So we're going to be blessed as we do this together. And just to hold on to this fact that God is in control. He's in control of history. He's in control of the universe. He's in control of your life and circumstances. Let's stand together and let me pray for you as we finish this morning. Father God, we thank you for this book, this letter. 
We thank you that you chose to reach into the lives of those churches there in Asia who are facing such difficult circumstances and to speak to them. But thank you, Father, your word's a living word. And your word is relevant, as relevant for us today as it was for them. And thank you that you're going to speak into our hearts, into our lives, as we work through this book together. Thank you that you're going to bless us. Thank you you're going to bless us. And Father, I pray for us all this morning that as we come into this year, whatever our circumstances or situations are, you'll help us to hold on to the reality that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What you've begun in our lives, you're still doing, you're going to work through, and you're going to see it to completion. You're going to see it all the way through, because what you start, you finish. And so as we complete our time together this morning, we commit one another into your hands, conscious of your grace and your mercy at work in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching and other videos at gbcweb.tv.